Buenos días. El debate, la marca significativa de las suelas ideas. Les quiero compartir a todos ustedes que es la primera vez en 10 años que antes del debate tengo otro debate aquí atrás, entonces estoy seguro que el debate de aquí enfrente se pondrá muy bien. El debate de este año es importantísimo por lo que se está viviendo. Es el tema del cambio climático. ¿Qué tanto afecta realmente al cambio climático lo que los humanos estamos produciendo, desperdiciando, acumulando y haciendo? Es común y es sabido por todos. Hay un enorme consenso de que, por supuesto, el cambio climático ocasionado y magnificado por los seres humanos es un hecho. Sin embargo, hay algunos países, pocos, pero algunos, sobre todo Estados Unidos, gente dentro de Estados Unidos, no todos, que argumentan que eso no es así. Queremos escuchar su punto de vista, queremos pensar al respecto y para ello traemos, por supuesto, a gente experta en el tema, y a otras personas que también quieren saber y quieren proponer y decirnos por qué piensan como piensan. Les voy a compartir rapidísimo las reglas del juego, lo cual nuestros seis distinguidos panelistas ya las conocen. Y les voy a presentar a cada uno de ellos. La primera regla del juego es respeto. Es que los argumentos son sobre ideas, y no sobre personas. Van a haber tres rounds, tres rounds. En el primero, cada uno va a tener cinco minutos para exponer su statement of purpose. ¿Por qué piensan como piensan? ¿Por qué dicen lo que dicen? ¿O cómo interpretan el problema? Porque por allí, seguramente, de entrada ya va a haber divergencia. A solicitud de los ponentes, van a hacerlo de manera consecutiva los tres que consideran que el cambio climático ocasionado por el ser humano es un verdadero problema y posteriormente serán las otras tres personas, o en distinto orden, pero serán consecutivos los que opinen distinto. En el segundo round... Cada uno va a tener tres minutos y vamos a ser muy especiales con el tiempo para decir o preguntar o cuestionar o argumentar por qué la opinión de alguien en particular del otro lado está cometiendo un crimen contra la lógica, no tiene datos, sus comentarios y argumentos son ideológicos más que científicos o hay alguna falla o una omisión o un desconocimiento importante. En el tercer round probablemente va a haber un diálogo o una pregunta de su servidor para terminar con conclusiones. Antes de comenzar, quiero presentarles a nuestros grandes ponentes. Y esa no, ahí no, y esa, y esa. Primero un aplauso y todos conocemos a nuestro premio Nobel, al doctor Mario Molina, científico mexicano especializado en química atmosférica, que investigó los efectos dañinos de la CFC sobre la capa de ozono. Después, un aplauso, por favor, a Daniel Schrack, que estudia el cambio climático en la más amplia gama de historia de la Tierra. Ha recibido importantes premios de las tres sociedades de física de Estados Unidos. Estuvo en Harvard y en Berkeley. También de este lado, que por supuesto consideran 
que el tema del cambio climático es una emergencia, es un problema muy severo y que tenemos que hacer los individuos de toda la sociedad ante un problema colectivo de esta, mate, de esta manera, actuar de manera responsable. Y Lawrence Krauss, que ya lo conocemos, su investigación se ha centrado en la intersección de la cosmología y la física de partículas elementales, la relatividad general, la gravedad cuántica y los inicios del universo. Autor de más de 10 bestsellers en ciencia, presidente del Consejo de la Junta del Boletín del, de la Ciencia Atómica y escribe sobre ciencia y política pública. And public policy. Perfecto. Del otro lado, también un aplauso para nuestros invitados. Tenemos aquí en el centro a William Hopper, que es físico de la Universidad de Princeton, fue director de la Oficina de Investigación Energética de 1990-1993 del DOE, inventó una guía de las estrellas de sodio que se utilizó en un telescopio moderno para compensar las turbulencias atmosféricas y coautor de uno de los primeros libros del de CO2 en 1982. Pero lo he traducido bien. Lord Nigel Lawson, miembro de la Casa de los Lords, eh, former, eh, fue ministro de finanzas de UK y de energía, autor de un libro que se llama An Appeal to Reason, A Cool Look at Global Warming, y founder, fundador y CEO de The Global Warming Policy Foundation. Un aplauso para él. Richard Linsen, también conocido por su obra en la dinámica del medio atmosférico. Richard ha trabajado en todos estos temas desde hace mucho tiempo y también es un conocedor de la materia. Señoras y señores, las reglas del juego. Ya se las dijimos. Van a empezar ellos tres. Va a empezar Lord. Lord, you're the first one. Harper, the third one. Four, five, six. Pero antes, préndanme las luces, por favor. Quiero saber que levante la mano quiénes están de acuerdo de que el cambio climático es un verdadero problema para la humanidad, que no es un mito y que está probado y que griten yo. Ok. Quienes piensan lo opuesto y son escépticos, dudan o necesitan un poquito más de conocimiento al respecto para probablemente definirse de un lado o del otro. Ok. Sin más preámbulos, bienvenidos al debate del cambio climático. Muchas gracias. Lord, you have five minutes. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Andres, and good morning, everybody. I'm afraid I can't speak Spanish, but I am really delighted that this great conference has decided to hold a debate about the important issue of climate change and climate change policy. And that, I'm afraid, is all too rare these days, when to question the conventional wisdom on this issue is usually considered an unacceptable heresy. And the doctrine has indeed become a substitute religion with all the intolerance that so many religions have shown over centuries. And it's also highly political. First and foremost, it's important to make be clear what this debate is about and what it is not about. What it is not about, at least not to any significant extent, is the science. We are indeed fortunate to have with us today in Professor Linzen the world's greatest living climate scientist, and I'm more than happy to leave the scientific dimension to him. But if I may dare to summarize what I believe to be the case, the amount of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere is one of a number of factors that affect the temperature of the planet. Other things being equal, which they may well not be, an increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide can be expected to warm the Earth although by how much is less clear. And there's no doubt that the burning of fossil fuels, coal, oil and gas, adds the amount 
of atmospheric CO2. But that is not what this debate is about. This debate is about politics and policy. According to what is now the conventional wisdom, climate change caused by man-made CO2 emissions is an existential threat greater than all others. In the words of President Obama in his 2015 State of the Union address, no challenge poses a greater threat to future generations than climate change, or to quote uh, France's President Hollande when he was opening the Paris Climate Conference later that same year, this was the last chance to show whether, and I quote, humankind is capable of deciding that we will preserve life on this planet. And the necessary means of doing so, it is held, is to abandon completely the use of fossil fuels. That is what the Paris Conference was about. So what we're debating today are two interlocking questions. Is the prospect of a warmer world the greatest problem facing humanity today, greater, for example, than the threat of nuclear war or from Islamic terrorism or global poverty, and I'll come to that later. I say it is not, far from it. And to the extent that it is a problem at all, should we respond by phasing out the use of fossil fuels? I say we should not. Indeed, that is a greater threat to humankind than global warming itself. So let's start with the facts. The Industrial Revolution occurred roughly 150 years ago. It was an energy revolution, a move away from windmills and water mills for basic energy and from horse-drawn carriages and ox carts and at sea sailing ships for transport, replacing them with fossil fuels, first coal, then oil and more recently gas. And this made possible the biggest game changer of all, the generation and widespread use of electricity. And the Industrial Revolution made possible the biggest improvement in living standards for ordinary people in the history of mankind. And what has happened to mean global temperature over those 150 years since we first switched to fossil fuels? According to the World Meteorological Organization, it has risen by a total of, wait for it, one degree Celsius. One degree in 150 years. That is, to put it bluntly, trivial. Yet it is seriously suggested, and this is the premise on which the Paris Climate Accord is explicitly based, that unless we can prevent more than a further half degree of warming, the planet is doomed. There is no scientific basis whatever for this. It is an entirely political number, plucked from the air and manifestly ludicrous. Uh, the, the climate, the temperature varies, of course, widely across the world. Uh, the average over the world as a whole is somewhere reckoned to be somewhere between 14 and a half degrees Celsius and 15 degrees Celsius. But take Singapore, a conspicuously successful country in economic terms, according to the IMF. I'm sorry, Lord, the time is over. Well, Un I'll have to por favor. finish briefly. I I'm have sorry, to, I'm sorry. No, I have to finish. I'm Half sorry, it's the same I have Un to applause, so pardon me. I have to we have to be serious we use, with the time, Lord. We Lord, use, Lord, I'm sorry. No, we you use, have I have to later. finish this. Just one, one second. I cannot do it. You will have the time later. Everybody okay. will be the same, okay? For everyone. There is no advantage for no one, okay? I'm sorry, Lord. Please, William, five minutes. Well, thank you very much, Lord Lawson. I, that was a very good introduction with which I agree. Uh, this whole movement reminds me of a famous book called Extraordinary Delusions, Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. And that's what we have here with the uh, climate change movement. Uh, you know, if you uh, actually look at the facts of climate, uh, it's hardly uh, Alarming, I think Dick Linson will make more comments about that, but take CO2, we keep hearing about CO2. I hope the uh, staff can show a, a meter here which has a, uh, the CO2 levels here where we're sitting on the stage. Uh, but uh, most of you know that in the outside air at sea level, uh, or at this level, it's about 400 parts per million. 
400. Numbers are important in all of this. It's not just feelings. And over most of the history of the Earth, certainly since the uh, Cambrian period when we have good fossil evidence of life, CO2 levels have been measured in thousands of parts per million, much, much higher than now. And the plants around us on which we depend, you know, to live, to get our food, our clothing, uh, are adapted to much higher CO2 levels than we have now. And the only clear evidence uh, of more CO2 that you can see, for example, from satellites looking down on the Earth, is not a lot of warming. The warming has been much, much less than models predicted, factors of two or more. But what you see is the entire Earth is getting greener. This is getting greener. Puebla is getting greener. You know, the Sahel is getting greener. The south of Africa, of south of the Sahara, is getting greener. And that's because plants are starved for CO2. We're in a CO2 famine today compared to geological history. And uh, the reasons for this are easy to see. You know, a plant is required to have little holes in its leaves to get CO2 from the air, to use in photosynthesis to make sugar and other organic molecules. But for every CO2 molecule that diffuses into the leaf of a plant, up to 100 water molecules diffuse out. So plants are faced with an engineering dilemma. They have to get CO2 through the holes in their leaves to live and to do photosynthesis, but at the same time they're drying out, so they're suffering from aridity. And so what people are observing now, and what was expected from experiments in greenhouses, is that plants are now growing leaves with fewer holes in them, so there are, there's less leakage of water, and therefore they don't need as much water, they grow better in arid regions like this state in Mexico, or like the Sahel in, uh, in Africa. So why is that a bad thing? And if you look at the actions we're taking to supposedly uh, combat this existential threat that Lord Lawson mentioned, uh, you can't figure out why we're doing them. Why, why for example, are we using 30% of the U.S. corn crop to make ethanol? It doesn't save any CO2 at all. You know, we heard a talk a day or two ago about, you know, using corn for meat. Well, we don't use corn for meat. We use corn to feed automobiles, not, not beef. So everything that we're doing is distorted. And uh, it, I think, will be looked on with great interest by historians for many years. There will be lots of dissertations written 50 years from now about the, this latest popular delusion uh, of the whole world in this case uh, over CO2. This meter, I, I, guess, I guess it's not being shown, but it, it, it shows here 419 parts per million. This is calibrated for sea level, so you have to multiply that by about 0.7. So, so uh, this is, uh, th this is uh, what we're li we're living in, if we had a, this meter out where you're sitting there, it would be typically a thousand parts per million just from breathing out. So let me leave you with one more number. Numbers are important. Each of us sitting here breathes out about two kilograms, I mean, uh, two pounds of CO2 per day, a little less than a kilogram Time. per day. Thank you very much. Un aplauso, por favor. <laughs> Richard, five minutes, please. <laughs> well, you know, we're talking about a political problem utilizing science. When you do that, you need two things. You need a simple picture of the science so people feel they understand it, and you need to be assured that all scientists agree so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, neither of these things are particularly correct, but they make you feel good. I'm concerned with the physical system that we're dealing with. And it isn't simple, it isn't one-dimensional, the ocean isn't passive, and something that is of interest to me, the upper-level cirrus, which displaces the greenhouse gases, they're not constant. 
What are we looking at? We're looking at a system that consists in two turbulent fluids, the atmosphere and the oceans. They're interacting with each other in a very intricate way. We're on a rotating planet that is differentially heated by the sun. The oceanic component has circulation systems with time scales ranging from years to millennia. And these systems carry heat to and from the surface, which is never in equilibrium with the sun because of this interchange with the ocean. And that provides variability that requires no external forcing. In addition to the oceans, the atmosphere is erect, interacting with a very irregular surface, which you see here every day. A vital constituent of the atmosphere is water in the liquid, solid, vapor phases, and the changes in phase have huge energetic ramifications. The energy budget of the system involves the absorption and re-emission of 200 watts per meter squared. Doubling CO2, what does that do? It involves a 2% perturbation in this budget, as do minor changes in clouds and other features, which are eminently common. What I want to stress is the ability of natural systems to produce large temporal variability without the need for external non-steady forcing. Nobody seriously questions the existence of solar cycles, of reversals of magnetic field, all of which occur without explicit temporal forcing. There is no reason to suppose that the atmosphere or that the, our climate system is any different. Now, what is the approach to this problem of those who promote alarm? The approach is the following. This complex, multi-factor system, the climate, which itself consists in many variables, is described by just one variable, the globally average temperature anomaly, and is controlled by a 2% perturbation in the energy budget due to one among many variables, namely CO2, and although we are not sure of the budget for this variable, we know precisely what policies to implement in order to control it. This represents an extraordinary claim, and usually extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence. Do we have this evidence? Of course not. Instead, we blame every natural disaster on global warming. Cold on warming, warmth on warming, floods on warming, droughts on warming, the Syrian civil war on warming, obesity on warming. As has long been noted, something that accounts for everything accounts for nothing. Many scientists find it convenient, given political correctness, to take the position that alarming impacts are possible. Not only is it impossible to prove something impossible, but this stance hardly justifies policy certainty. Also, the notion that something is true unless proven untrue turns the scientific method on its head. Now, instead of discussing the real policy, we discuss minute changes in temperature and so on, and then we bring in all the disaster scenarios, but, you know, they are not even based on models. They were already introduced in a kind of science fiction way in the early 60s and even late 50s. Now, Goebbels claimed that a big enough lie, repeated often enough, comes to be regarded as truth. Climate alarmism is a perfect example. Okay, time is over. Un aplauso para él, por favor. Doctor Mario Molina, cinco minutos. ¿Por qué piensan como piensan? Cinco minutos, pues. Gracias por la oportunidad de platicar con ustedes, aunque sea muy brevemente. Voy a hacer unos cuantos puntos uh, para explicarles nuestra posición. Primero, que hay un consenso extraordinario entre los expertos, no entre todos los científicos, los expertos en, en, en estos temas de cambio climático, 
de más del 97%, y no es una cuestión de opinión, esto se ha medido y haciendo no solo encuestas, sino publicaciones científicas, etc. Entonces está clarísimo que la gran mayoría de los expertos está totalmente de acuerdo, inclusive lo que acabamos de oír pues no está en tanto desacuerdo, de que hay un cambio de clima, ya está ocurriendo, y de que está causado por actividades de la humanidad. Eso está muy claro, pero aclaro, también estamos de acuerdo en que el clima es un sistema complejo. Entonces los científicos opinan que no tienen la certeza absoluta de que esto está ocurriendo debido a las actividades humanas, pero es cuestión de probabilidades. Según el consenso hay más del 95% de probabilidad que eso sea el caso. Pero en fin, el segundo punto, quizá más importante, es que no solo es clima, el clima a finales de siglo, ya estamos viendo los cambios y ya nos están dando una indicación de por qué preocuparnos. Los cambios los llamamos extremos de clima. Y, y al principio, hace varios años, los científicos muy cuidadosos decían, bueno, a lo mejor no tenemos estadísticas, pero ya se sabe con, con mucha claridad, de nuevo, en base en probabilidades, no en certezas absolutas, pero probabilidades enormes de que lo que pasó, por ejemplo, en el Caribe, se debe a un cambio de temperatura en la superficie de los océanos, los expertos en huracanes lo tienen clarísimo. Y eso causa daños espantosos. Y no es porque no haya pasado lo mismo hace muchos cientos de miles de años. Sí, por supuesto, hace 55 millones de años hacía más calor, pero había cocodrilos en el Polo Norte. En fin, no sobreviviríamos fácilmente esos cambios porque están pasando mucho más rápidamente de lo que ha pasado en, en épocas geológicas. Entonces, ya tenemos cambio climático y es altamente preocupante. Y el tercer punto, de, ya quizá no es ciencia, pero trabajando con economistas y con, con la sociedad en general, ¿qué se puede hacer? La ciencia no nos dice qué hacer, pero sí nos dice qué pasaría si no hacemos nada. Y lo más importante aquí con economistas es que podemos hacer un cambio que ya no nos cuesta. Podemos dejar de emitir esta enorme cantidad de dióxido de carbono que ha subido pues, más del 40% repentinamente en una escala geológica. Lo mismo que la temperatura. Ha subido, sí, en, como oíamos, pues, sí, en, 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 en cientos de miles de años anteriores, pero no en un siglo. Eso no había pasado con esta preocupación. Pero además, ya no nos cuesta gran cosa. Se puede hacer lo que llamamos desarrollo sustentable, energías renovables, Prácticamente lo podemos hacer con ingenuidad, de tal manera que no haya problemas con la pobreza. Al revés, podemos ayudar a que haya menos gente pobre, porque ellos serían, y ya están siendo, los más afectados por el cambio climático. Muchos muertos con ondas de calor, que claramente se deben al cambio climático. Eso no cabe duda por mediciones de satélites. Y también pues, están incendios forestales. Hay toda una serie de impactos clarísimos que ya están causando migraciones enormes. Si no hiciéramos nada, lo que quiero quizá terminar haciendo un punto importantísimo es una cuestión de riesgo. Por lo que oímos, pues no es tanto negando que hay un riesgo de que la temperatura pueda subir, pero el riesgo es este, de que si no hacemos nada, si hacemos lo que nos diría, por ejemplo, el presidente Trump, no hacerle caso a todo esto, lo que podría suceder es que de aquí a finales de siglo suba la temperatura hasta 5 grados, no es lo más probable, pero podría ser una probabilidad quizá de 1 en 5. Esa probabilidad es gigantesca. Si subiera tanto la temperatura, sí sería terrible para la civilización. Habría partes del planeta que no serían habitables. No estamos hablando de que todo desaparezca toda la vida ni la humanidad. No estamos exagerando. No somos exagerados los científicos. Pero de que hay un riesgo totalmente inaceptable, de eso estamos todos de acuerdo con los economistas, con los políticos y por supuesto está basado en ciencia muy, muy bien establecida. Realmente no cabe duda de que tenemos que hacer algo todos juntos como sociedad porque todos saldríamos ganando. México, por fortuna, es un líder en ese cambio entre los países en desarrollo. Sigamos trabajando juntos. Ya lo hicimos con la capa de sonos. Sí se pudo. Vamos a volver a hacerlo. Gracias. Daniel, five minutes, please. Thank you. I'm a, a geologist and a climate scientist. And let me give you a little perspective first from Earth history. Uh, we've heard that the 
climate system is so complicated that we can't possibly predict the effect of CO2. And yet, what we see at these times when carbon dioxide was higher, as uh, William Happer suggested, um, Mario mentioned that these were times of very warm climate. Indeed, there's a very strong correlation of carbon dioxide with climate change throughout Earth history. When carbon dioxide is high, the climate is warm, and when carbon dioxide is cold, the climate is cold. When, when, the, when carbon dioxide is low, the climate is cold. Um, now, correlation doesn't mean causation, but the fact is we've known that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas for over 100 years. As Nigel Lawson said, nobody is really disputing the basic physics of the greenhouse effect. And so, so the important point is when we look to the geologic past, we see a strong connection between carbon dioxide and the temperature of the Earth. And that is partly why we can actually have some confidence in the projections that say that continued additions of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere bring great risk of global temperature change. Now let's think about the modern and think about what's actually happening. I, I agree that one single number, a global average temperature, doesn't mean much to most of us. Uh, there are lots of different impacts. One of the ones that is more global is sea level rise. There are variations in different places. But we see sea level going up. Today, by satellite measurement, we know that it's going up about 3.4 millimeters a year. Now, by itself, that isn't that much. That's 35 centimeters over a century. Maybe that's tolerable. Um, but realize that this is going to keep going and that it's accelerating. In the 70s and 80s, that number was only closer to 2 millimeters a year. And back in the earlier part of the century, it was closer to 1 millimeter a year. We've seen an increase in sea level rise. And even if we look at things like the melting of the Greenland ice sheet, by measurement of the gravitational field of the Earth, we can actually measure how much mass is being lost from Greenland. And we know that that rate of in, put in terms of sea level rise, 10 years ago was half a millimeter a year. Today, it's closer to 0.8 millimeters a year. So we've seen an acceleration in just 10 years. So, so to me, this is not just about making a perfect forecast of the future. This is about looking at the trends. The trends are getting worse. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? So in the last two minutes, let me turn to that topic. Because there's this supposition that we want to essentially destroy all of the basis of society. It is true that fossil fuels, access to cheap energy, has led to the most incredible economic growth and quality of life, decrease of of child mortality, increase in life expectancy, all sorts of wonderful things in our modern world. We ultimately, though, have to get rid of fossil fuel, or at least the CO2 that comes from burning of fossil fuels if we're going to solve the climate problem. Now, that doesn't mean we need to stop using fossil fuels tomorrow. Our world is dependent on it. Let's, let's be serious. I'm going to Boston right after this debate, and I'm not going to ride a bicycle to Boston. I'm going to get on a big airplane. It burns a lot of petroleum. The reality is that transforming the world's energy system is very difficult. I've been studying this for the last decade, and it's going to take a long time, probably 100 years. Our idea is not to just ban fossil fuels, but to ultimately invest in technology that will someday displace fossil fuels. We're not talking about a, a burdensome uh, a tax that will stifle society. We're talking about something like $30 a ton of carbon dioxide. That's like 25 cents a gallon of gasoline or 7 cents a liter of petrol. That's, that's not going to hurt. That's not going to crush society. And ultimately, what those investments have already done, for example, in the U.S. in the last six years, we've seen the price of solar photovoltaics drop by a factor of five. In the UK, we've seen offshore wind just in the last three years drop by a factor of almost three. So this technology and innovation is already paying off. Why wouldn't we want to use this as an insurance policy in case climate change is much worse than we expect? I'll stop there. Thank you. Gracias, Daniel. Lawrence, five minutes. Okay. Uh, thanks, Dan. Um, I want to start by saying that um, it's unfortunate we're having a debate on this subject. And it's, there's a good reason why we don't normally have debates on this subject, because it's not debatable. Uh, 
we don't debate facts. You debate policies. That's why we don't have debates on whether the Earth is 6,000 years old or 4.5 billion years old. There are some people who do think it is, but we don't put them on stage because it gives the illusion that there's controversy. And when you have a debate like this, it gives you the illusion that there's controversy because there are three people and three people. But if it was accurate, there'd be 10,000 scientists on this side and three people on that side. <laughs> now, so I just want to frame that. And the key point is that climate change is not, and we'll get to it, there's model-dependent aspects of the future, but it's happening. It is happening. The data says it's happening. And that's what's really important. Now, when talking to people who, who deny climate change in one way or another, there are two sets of, of viewpoints. There are people who uh, act like scientists, and I'd say what, what we heard from, in, from Dr. Lindzen is exactly that, saying, okay, the, we can discuss models, we can discuss interpretations of the data. There's data and there's models. And then there are people who distort the data. And I think we heard that from Lord Lawson and, and Will Happer. And we hear it from highly financed groups that have spent more money distorting reality, like the Koch brothers, than is entirely spent by the research on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So there's an incredible amount of money deny, using things that deny the facts, like the, the claim that one degree is not important, or the claim that we're getting greener everywhere, that there aren't more droughts, that there aren't more extreme weather events, which is exactly what the IPCC has found. Or using tricks like, say, bringing a snowball into, into the Senate and saying climate change isn't happening, or bringing a carbon dioxide meter in a room full of people breathing carbon dioxide and claiming that has anything to do with the climate. Nothing. So, the, the key point there here is that I'm not a climate scientist. And, uh, and there are three active climate scientists in, in this room, okay? The others aren't. But I'm a scientist, and I can at least look at data, and I can look at papers, and I, I can ask what seems reasonable and what doesn't. And what is remarkable is that the basic physics of climate change isn't rocket science. It's the greenhouse effect of carbon dioxide. And isn't it remarkable that when you just look at the effects that are happening now, they're consistent with what you'd expect from basic physics? Now, that could be a remarkable conspiracy. It could be a remarkable conspiracy based on all sorts of physics we don't understand. But the simplest thing is, the physics we do understand explains it. And so, as a scientist, I look at this and I say, well, that seems reasonable. Then I look at other things and I say, you know what, the models are complicated as you just pointed out, but they predict things like ice loss in Greenland should be greater than in Ant Antarctica. What's happening? The ice loss in Greenland is greater than that in Antarctica. That gives me confidence as a scientist that we are in the right direction. And you know what? The ice loss is actually greater than the models predict, which tells me the models are conservative, which tells me I should maybe worry. And that comes to the, the, to the last thing I really want to point out. As Dan pointed out, no one, unlike the claim he is here, is saying we should all ride horses tomorrow and, 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 and stop r driving cars. The point is, we're arguing that what's... A, I, I, it's hard to understand how anyone could argue against innovation. Let's say we wean ourselves off fossil fuel and we do it by innovation. Is that a bad thing, by creating new technologies and new jobs? Let's compare that to the opposite. So let's say they're right. Okay, and climate isn't changing. What happens? We've got a lot of new technology. Oh dear, what a sad story. Okay, but let's say, there, let's say that every other scientist who's looking at this is right. Let's look at the risks. Over the last 500,000 years, you can look at carbon dioxide where it was less than half of what it is now, and you can actually model it, and the models fit pretty well. But more important, the sea level changed by maybe 80 meters. 100,000 years ago, when the last time the sea, sea temperature was the same as it is now, the sea level rise was 6 meters. So if they're wrong, we have potentially huge problems. So the risk is clear. Louis Pasteur, the, the scientist, once said, fortune favors the prepared mind. If you look at the risks in one direction, we spend a lot of money doing innovation. The risk in the other direction is we produce catastrophic problems for hundreds of millions of people around the world who lose their land. Clearly, the risks say, let's just do what's reasonable. Thank you. Bravo. Wow. Muchos argumentos de un lado y del otro. 
es el momento de que cada uno de ustedes le dirija su pregunta o su comentario al lado contrario. Tienen tres minutos para mostrar y decirnos dónde hay un crimen contra la lógica del argumento, por qué consideran que la persona del otro lado esté equivocada o qué omitieron y no tuvieron el tiempo suficiente para elaborar y quisieran aprovechar estos tres minutos para poder hacerlo. Tres minutos, ahora nos iremos indistintamente de aquí para allá. ¿Ok? Lord, si no, uh, would you like to start? ¿Quién quiere empezar de este lado? Lord, Richard, ¿quién would like to begin? Richard. Well, one hardly knows where to start, and three minutes will not be enough. Uh, Krauss speaks of basic physics. Well, as I mentioned, the basic physics that he's describing is one-dimensional, but we can use it. You've seen temperature go up. You've seen CO2 increase. You've seen the IPCC say that they believe most of the increase is due to man. You could also calculate what sensitivity is most consistent with that data. Most consistent is the sensitivity of three quarters of a degree. Models often have higher sensitivity, but they use fudge factors called aerosols to cancel. To get more than one and a half degrees, they have to get more cancellation than is permitted by present data. So if you're going to go by the data, the data is telling you Change occurs, it always occurs, and if it's due to CO2, it suggests a minor problem. I also don't like the money issue. I think that comes close to a personal attack. None of us have received any money from any of the sources you mentioned. Government funding, which is distinctly prejudicial, has increased by a factor of 15 by 90, between 1989 and 1993. Mario mentions the 97% as a fact. I have no idea what fact you're talking about. It's a bogus study, and you never heard what the question was. The question was, does climate change occur? Everyone agrees climate change occurs. And then it was, does man have any impact? The answer is yes, some. As I mentioned, it seems pretty small. How is that proof of anything unless you wish it to be propaganda to convince people who don't know what you're talking about. Now, Schrag mentioned sea level. Sea level is an interesting issue. It's a very difficult thing to measure. We've measured it with tidal gauges. The tidal gauges measure land relative to sea. You have to pick tidal gauges in tectonically stable regions. They give you the six inches a century. Then you have satellite measurements, and they are dependent critically on knowing the GI, geoids, the shape of the Earth. Smallest errors in that can change the slope a great deal. What do we do? What does Krauss do? He takes one set of data, says it's all right until you start the satellite, tag on the satellite, say that's an acceleration, and continue the acceleration indefinitely. You would flunk a physics student who did that in a freshman lab. Thank you. Wow. That's very good, but I... Se está calentando el cambio climático en el auditorio. Lawrence, okay. is your, is your talk. Let, let me point out, uh, Richard, that I never mentioned the word acceleration in my talk, but in any case, my, my colleague Dan did, who actually studies this and knows what he's talking about, so I'll, I'll let him refer, discuss that. Um, I did talk about net, climb, net sea level change, which you will not disagree with because, yeah. again, it's a fact. Okay, good. Um, the, when, let me just say a few things. Uh, I, didn't, I, didn't talk, I talked about money in general. I talked about the Koch brothers, which is really important to talk about, I think, because a lot of of people who, and, and, I, and I think this is what's really important, not necessarily in this panel, because this panel will end, but when people hear these discussions, you should ask yourself, are the people claim, making claims benefiting from what they're saying? Now, the climate scientists are going to be 
funded or not funded, depending on whatever they find. They're just doing science. But say when a representative in the gas and oil industry says that there's no big effect, what do you think the problem is? Now, I should say when it comes to funding, I, and I have to say this, Lord Lawson runs a, uh, uh, an organization that denies climate change, but hasn't told us where the funding comes from, so I don't know where it's going to come from. But anyway, that's a different question. The point is, when we talk about... Um, okay, well, there you go. Um, when one talks about temperature change, one should point out two things. That net temperature change is one thing, but, it, but one thing that is accelerating is the... and that has been accelerating since the 1960s, is the amount of carbon dioxide put in the atmosphere. And the question is, What's the rate of change of things? You can't say things have been constant. And if the rate of change is accelerating, as is the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that's an interesting observation. And of course, that's what's happening to both carbon dioxide and temperature. 2014, 2015, 2016 have been consecutively the warmest years we've had. So, so we're seeing the effects accelerating. And that's an important indicator that on a very short time frame, things are happening. Now, the one thing I want to add, and it's, is, that's relevant because it didn't come up, is the important fact that carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for a long time. So when one is talking about action and policy, the point is delaying our policies means that the carbon dioxide we put in today will still be here, not just tomorrow, but at least 600 years, and maybe some people say up to much longer. So every bit of carbon dioxide we're putting in the atmosphere today will remain there. And so we are not talking just about this generation, and if we change things now, then our children and our children's children will be fine. What we put in today will affect our children, our grandchildren, and their grandchildren. And that's why we're talking about something that is of vital importance, not just now, but in the far future. Okay. Gracias. William. Well, I certainly agree with... Uh... Dick Lenz, and, and let me uh, talk a little bit about the correlation between CO2 and temperature. It's true if you look at ice cores that the uh, proxies for temperature and, and the actual measurements of CO2 in the bubbles track, but in every careful study, the temperature first rises and then CO2 rises and the temperature first falls and then CO2 falls, so that what is causing, what is causing what's effect is that temperature is causing changes of CO2, at least for the last million years. There's no question about that. Uh, if you look over longer periods of time, there were major worldwide ice ages in the Ordovician you know, in the Paleozoic, when CO2 levels were 10 times what they are now. So how did that happen? Uh, in fact, the correlation between temperature and uh, CO2 is not all that good. And I don't know what correlation matters. Uh, uh, Mr. Dr. Krauss says that, you know, the CO2 levels have gone, gone up and uh, the uh, temperature has gone up. Well, so has the price of a first-class stamp in the United States gone up. It correlates just as well with CO2 as does the temperature. So, I, I, as people have known for many years, correlation is not causation. And, and yet, this movement keeps saying that. Now, let me say something about conflicts of interest. There's nobody more conflicted than someone with a government grant to study climate. You don't get that grant unless uh, it's pretty clear to the grantee that you're going to come up with an, a result that uh, supports the party line. I know that because I used to make grants. From 1990 to 1993, I ran the Department of Energy's basic research. We made a lot of grants. I was glad to support climate science. In fact, I started the ARM program, very nice set of instruments in Oklahoma and elsewhere in the world that are making some of the best data available. And, uh, but I can assure you that even at that time, if we were worried that uh, we might get the wrong answer. We didn't make the grant. So uh, anyone with a government grant is conflicted, you know, period. They're conflicted. Uh, I think that's all I want to say right now. Gracias. Thank you. Wow. Paz, Daniel. Boy, it's interesting. I had a government grant to study climate change during the George W. Bush administration. 
And I didn't feel a great need to say exactly what George W. Bush thought about climate change. So I'm, I'm not quite sure I agree with you that people who get government grants are conflicted in terms of the science they, they talk about. The other thing I want to mention quickly to William Happer is that nobody said that carbon dioxide was a poison. The fact that CO2 in the room might be a little high because we're all breathing, who cares? It's not going to kill us. And by the way, that time 50 million years ago called the Eocene, when carbon dioxide was something like 1,000 parts per million, and the climate was about 8 or 10 degrees warmer than today, that would have been a perfectly fine climate to live in. Nobody is disputing that. Nothing was wrong with that climate. It was much warmer. Sea level was about 100 meters higher than today. And uh, there were, as Mario said, there were, uh, po there were palm trees in Wyoming and crocodiles living up above the Arctic Circle. The problem is that we're adapted to this climate. We build cities close to sea level. We have people living in places where they get water from snow on the mountains. That snow didn't exist in the Eocene. It was too warm for that snow to fall on the mountains. And so could we survive? Of course we could, but we, we are adapted to this climate, and it's all about time scale. The climate is changing so quickly that it's all about rate. So, uh, you know, the fact that CO2 was higher back in Earth history to me is a, a sign of the trouble that we're in. And let me be very clear, carbon dioxide has never been as high as it is today for the last, we know directly for at least the last 800,000 years, and indirectly it's probably something like four or five million years. We are doing an experiment on the planet at a rate that has never been seen before. And, you know, Dick, Dick says that um, the temperature sensitivity would only be three quarters of a degree. I don't know how you get that because it's warmed by more than one degree and we haven't yet doubled CO2. So the reality is that um, it looks like we're probably in for at least another degree of warming and maybe three or four. That three or four degrees is catastrophic. The difference between the glacial maximum 20,000 years ago when CO2 was 180 parts per million and the difference between that and the pre-industrial period was only five degrees Celsius. That difference was equivalent to about 120 meters of sea level rise. Five degrees global average was the difference between a kilometer of ice on top of where I live in Boston and the Boston that I live in today. We're talking about perhaps going five degrees warmer in the next century. And if it's not the next century, it'll be the next 150 years or 200 years. That's really what's at stake. Thank you. Lord. Let me start by saying that I'm very sorry that Mr. Krauss took it upon himself to make a personal attack on me and suggest that uh, my uh, foundation was funded by fossil fuel interests. We have made it clear, we have made it clear that we will take no money from the fossil fuel industry or anyone with a large stake in that industry. We have made that absolutely clear. So in the first place, he's calling me a liar, and I don't like being called a liar. In the second place, even if he does think I'm a liar, I have among my fellow trustees in the foundation a former private secretary to the Queen, a former head of the British Civil Service, and a bishop of the Church of England, all colleagues of mine in the House of Lords, as it happens. He is therefore implying that there's a conspiracy among all of us, to lie and to pretend that we're not taking money from the fossil fuel industry when we are. That is paranoia, at the very least. Uh, I have, would, however, like to make common cause in as much as I can with what has been said from the other side. Uh, most of it uh, is uh, completely mistaken, as uh, Dick Lindsen has, in a short time he had, pointed out pretty well. Uh, but I, I absolutely agree. I'm all in favor of investment in new technologies to see whether you can come up with some new source of energy which is cheap and reliable and we can all move to. That's great. Let's do it. But you can't assume it'll happen. Uh, I remember when I was uh, energy minister in the UK, uh, I was told that that was 35 years ago. I was told that fusion 
would produce energy economically within 25 years. We're no nearer now than we were then. Uh, so you can't assume it, but what you do know is that the, uh, the far and away the cheapest source of energy now and most reliable is fossil fuels. Uh, this is what people depend on. This is what above all the poor depend on. And to deprive them of fossil fuels, force them to make, have higher energy costs, means more poverty, more uh, cure, uh, preventable disease, more premature deaths, and is unconscionable. And this is to, start, to eliminate fossil fuels now, which is the attempt of the Paris Agreement to try and do as quickly as possible, is far worse than anything which is being proposed by us on this side. It's, it's, it's monstrous, it is immoral, and I, this is why. And the, the, whoever said it's policy we should be discussing, not facts, I agree. We should not Time. go Un around that road. Por favor. <clears throat> Mario, <clears throat> Dr. Mario Molina. Okay, I'm going to switch to English now. Sorry about that, so that we are uh, debating more directly. Um, first of all, the point on conflicts of interest and so on. I certainly disagree as well that if you have funding from the government that you have uh, uh, some sort of conflict. There are many scientists also that have not directly connected with making a state about, uh, making some statement about the politics of, of uh, climate change. But in fact, let me point out very directly just the opposite. We in the scientific world, and just about everybody agrees with that, if you have a discrepancy with what seems to be the consensus, the agreement of a certain scientific think, way of thinking, and if you can document it, maybe it will cost you some uh, trouble at the beginning, but you can certainly publish it. But at the point, if it's sensible, after a, whatever time it, it takes, you become, you become a hero. But of course, the other way around it doesn't work if what you're stating and claiming doesn't make much sense, you do not become a hero. So we have a huge uh, uh, so, sort of impulse to try to find out what's wrong with what everybody is thinking about climate change, and that people have been trying very hard, believe me, and they're nowhere close. We haven't heard any really reasonable explanation that really goes against what you have heard on, from our side that's been stated. How does the natural climate work? I, I could ask, her, for example, uh, Mr. Harper, uh, do you agree that uh, these extreme events, we are, not talking that, we are not saying that they are caused by climate change, but that the probability that they are more intense has increased recently. That these are data, these are facts. And if that's the case, that's something negative. Uh, we cannot talk about very positive things coming out of climate change because it's happening so fast and because civilization has grown up in, in the Eocene in these last 10,000 years with a very stable climate. So there are all sorts of reasons why it would be very disruptive for, from a politics and economics point of view to suddenly have a, a, a very different climate. And also, very briefly, let me say, we don't have to wait for innovation now. We already have relatively cheap renewable energies. So innovation will, will move it even further, faster and better, so that we all have a better standard of living. But why risk the standard of living of our uh, ch children, grandchildren, and so on? That, to me, is highly responsible because the risk is huge. Explain to me why you think the risk is negligible. Please, that would be important. Given the fact that, gracias a todos ustedes, given the fact that some of your questions were pretty clearly directed to another of, yeah. I will let you, two minutes to each of you to, to answer exactly what, I mean, we could start with you, Richard, if you want to have two well, minutes, and then with you, Lawrence. There are very few things one has time to answer, but first of all, I would like the audience to consider the following. In 1998, the temperature reached a maximum and then hovered around it. Remember, it's an uncertain measurement 
for 18 years. The counter to that by Dr. Krauss is we've had some of the highest temperatures on record during that period. Does that contradict the statement that the temperature did not change yes. within fluctuations? No, it doesn't. If it didn't change, I could say 18 of the hottest years on record have been the last 18 years. It's the use of that misleading argument that makes, should make you question whether you've been led astray. Now, Mario asks, why do we think it's not serious? And the answer is simply, I mean, Dan should know the answer to the question he asked. There is almost a doubling of CO2's radiative forcing when you include N2O, NH3, and so ammonia. Yeah, it's three and a half versus 3.7. What do you want? And the fact that that is still leading to that, even if you include transiency, is most consistent with 0.75. So that's one reason I don't think it's serious. Now, you mentioned the exponential growth. Well, but it's also a logarithmic effect. So it's linear. And it's saying each doubling will do the same thing. So if a doubling does three quarters, another doubling will do that. We've then pretty much run out of way to go, no matter how much time you give it. So I think it pays to understand that this is a scientific question at this level, it is motivated by politics because energy is a huge part of the economy. But please, time is over. Lawrence. Well, you know, I don't know whether it, from a, I, I want to respond, but I think it's better let Dan, res I mean, intellectually, it's probably better let Dan respond to what, what Richard just said. So, because people forget what Richard just said in a few minutes. So maybe it's better to do that. Would you, is that okay? That sounds reasonable. So, so Richard, you are the, uh, as you know, starting from your former colleague, Jules Charney, but continuing to this day, uh, the consensus on climate sensitivity is more like between one and a half and something like three and a half or four degrees. You have always been on well below the rest of the group. Um, let's talk a little bit about why the temperature pattern hasn't followed perfectly the carbon dioxide. And the reason you know, Dick, is because the ocean is a big heat sink. Imagine you start adding carbon dioxide and you have an earth that's three quarters covered by ocean. Well, what happens is the ocean's moving heat around, as Dick said in the very beginning, and it's resisting the heat. It's actually, in fact, 90% of the energy from the greenhouse gases um, is actually absorbed by the ocean. So it's ironic, but actually sea level rise that we see that's mostly due to thermal expansion is actually global warming. That is global warming. That is the warming of the oceans. Now, what that does to the surface temperature, what it means is that the ocean warming is, is global warming and the surface temperature is the tail of the dog. And what happens is we've, there are cycles in the ocean and in fact the best explanation in my opinion for why there's been kind of a, a, uh, fluctuations in the rate of warming is because of cycles in the ocean. I suspect sometime in the next 10 years we're gonna see a time like the mid 70s when we're gonna warm even quicker and that that's part of the natural cycle. That is the interaction of the natural cycle with adding all this carbon dioxide. Um, uh, but to say that, that the warming has stopped for the last 18 years is just not true. Look at the data yourself. You would never come to that conclusion. And you, please, go look at the data yourself. You will actually see it's not that complicated. Gracias. Okay. Lord. The... The fact is that the gentleman over there talked about this huge increase in extreme weather events. Uh, Professor Pilko, who has made the greatest study of extreme weather events, has found that there has been overall a no increase in extreme weather events. There has been some years when there's more, some years when there are fewer. And if you take, because it's important in this particular area, uh, tropical storms, uh, because the Bay of Mexico is particularly an area for tropical storms. The, although it has been a very bad year this year, the previous 10 years were unusually low. And this, this varies, uh, and the, the fact of the matter is that le the, the trouble with renewable energy 
is that it is intermittent. You cannot yet store electricity on any large scale. If you could, and let's have more research into the possibilities, but there's been an enormous amount of research and you can't do it. Therefore, it is inevitably going to be more expensive. You didn't need an international agreement to go to fossil fuels 150 years ago. It was obvious that you would do it. Now it is obvious that you shouldn't. There's only an international agreement which is trying to force people. And those, that will force people to, in the poorer countries of the world, with the hundreds of millions of people still in dire poverty, to die younger, to have diseases that they didn't need to have disease. And, and it is monstrous to impose on this, these poor people a policy which is dictated only by this politically correct obsession. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Dr. Mario Molina. I feel compelled to... <laughs> Let me answer. I feel compelled to, to do that. First of all, with Roger Pilke, you are just about, oh, maybe a decade behind the facts, okay? We should not create our own facts in spite of the example that we have in a neighboring country, okay? So the facts are, and you can see the curves and so on, that the extreme events have increased, no doubt whatsoever, okay? Let me make that clear. Uh, the second point, another fact, is that the economists, people that we have discussed with, very clever, they published, ever heard of, are completely in disagreement with you. That's awful, because you're, the consequence of, of what you're saying is, is, a, is a terrible thing to do for future generations. What's a disagreement? It's the poor people that are going to suffer most from these changes in the weather that we have. And the economists we work with, and others, and many, have worked together, and they claim very clearly that if we work in a creative way, we work all together, that's going to be the way to decrease poverty, not to increase it. So that, these are all facts. These are all things that have well established in the literature, uh, and so on and so forth. So there's really no need to discuss these sort of uh, uh, obvious things that have happened. Uh, Dick Linson also, you mentioned that this 97% uh, is uh, something fictitious. No, it I'm has been terribly well documented, okay? It has been extremely well documented with interviews and so on. So the, it's very clear that there are just a handful of scientists that disagree, and we have discussed with them. We have, it's not that we do, have not considered their opinions. They have been discussed very, very carefully, and it really doesn't matter. They don't make much sense. That's yeah, a point. You have two minutes. You, I, mean, but I, I, I didn't get my turn. I, mean, I, I did not get my turn. Mario. No, no, no. It will happen. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Then yeah. okay. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let, let me talk about uh, you know, the, the current warming. There's absolutely nothing unusual about the warming we've had over the past 50 years. It's not nearly as much as the warming that led to the settlement of Greenland by the Norse you know, around the year 900, uh, 1000, there was massive melting of the glaciers and the Alps during that time. So uh, what's new, you know, and, and how do I know it's due to CO2? It's probably not. It's probably mostly natural, just as it was when the Vikings sailed and when the Alps glaciers melted. Secondly, let me talk about scientific consensus. When I was a graduate student in 1960, nobody believed in continental drift, and there had been conferences in the United States of United States geologists, you know, completely dismissing continental drift and, and uh, denigrating Wegener, the man who proposed continental drift, and it was a hundred percent consensus. It wasn't 97 percent practically. There were people in the southern hemisphere who were sympathetic, but nobody in North America. So scientific consensus is often wrong. Another good example is the consensus over eugenics in America in the early part of the last century, 1900, the late 1800s. You know, it, it was fabricated data, it was wrong, it, it was designed to show that the Anglo-Saxon race was better than any other race in the world, and it was nonsense. And, and yet, 
it was a consensus, and every university president in the United States, people who could hold themselves up in faculty meetings, they all agreed on eugenics. So, consensus doesn't mean anything. Okay. Okay, you have two yeah, minutes. Yeah, I can finally get back. First of all, Lord Lawson, I, did, I, I don't think I ever called you a liar, certainly never meant to. Um, I did say at the time that, that we hadn't heard who funded your organization, and I'm extremely happy that you now say that, that, that no one with any vested interest funds it. Now, I've uh, said well, in any case, I'm very happy to hear you say it. And so, but the, all that means to me is that there must be another reason why your organization is denying the evidence of reality, and that's fine, that's up to you. But, uh, it, you know, so there's a, some, other rational, some other rationale for why you're denying the data and the models. Now, when it comes to quoting an individual, and, and Mary already hit it, you can always find an outlier to say anything. So finding someone who says something, I was just talking to a journalist about 300 people who are saying the earth is flat at a scientific meeting right now. You can find PhDs to say anything. In, in terms of the, the um, Will's statement about the, the correlation not being causation, that's a very important point. But when, in science, when you say the relationship between correlations and causation, it's when you have an underlying physical mechanism. And then you can try and uh, make predictions and look at correlations, and that's exactly what the climate scientists do. They don't just say, these things are happening, They're, there's actually an underlying physical mechanism. I think the, 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 the key point that, that you just said about, about uh, consensus is actually the really important point. Scientists are not funded, and in fact, it would be awful. I was funded by you, and I've always been funded by the Department of Energy, and it would have been awful if you told me what to do. Scientists go out and try and prove their colleagues wrong, because that's the way to become famous. And you know how you do it? You provide evidence and theories, and eventually, at first it may be hard, but eventually you get consensus, and maybe eventually you win a Nobel Prize for showing that something was not believed, like like Maria Molina did, is actually true. And so I say to you, if you have some argument why everyone is wrong, go out and try and give, uh, provide an underlying mechanism. None of you ever Time have. Un applauso, por okay. favor. <laughs> eh, me están pidiendo un comentario más. Les voy a dar un minuto a los que lo necesiten, pero si de este lado hay un minuto, de este lado habrá un minuto, o viceversa. Dos, dos, or tres, tres. We don't understand it. I will explain it in English. Okay. You will, you will, some people here to my right needs another minute, so you will have also another minute. In case you need two minutes, you will have two minutes. We will have exactly a fair timing sharing for each of the sides. And after that, I will have a question and I will have to leave. So, you are. Yeah, please. I would just love to know from you, Mario, with extreme weather, why you contradict the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which concluded they could find no relation between extreme weather and climate change. Can I answer? Yes. Here again, you are at the wrong time. I would encourage you to read data from this year, for example, or even last year. Uh, just uh, to, to carry a manual, you know very good. Oh, come Dick on. and I were, come on, come on. Please, I'm talking. We were neighbors, we were good friends for many years, but uh, uh, <clears throat> Kerry Manuel is also our neighbor. He's the global expert on hurricanes. He just has a paper. Please read the, read the recent literature, because if we go back 10 or 20 years, of course, climate change was not that well established at that time. But now, it's very clearly established, no doubt whatsoever, in spite of you. Excuse that me. The hurricanes in the, in the for example, Mario. That's what, wait, I am talking. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to Kerry. Talk to Kerry. You can answer afterwards. But Kerry has it demonstrated very clearly that there is just a very high probability. And the same thing has happened with all the other extreme events. I'm sorry, I had to finish. If you want to respond, I'm, I'm, I apologize for being rude, but let, I just had to talk about what is the current science, what's the scientific consensus about which there is no doubt whatsoever. Is that clear? Please. It is not only clear, it's wrong. You I cannot, don't think it's wrong. Let me now, Mario. 
You cannot okay. make long-term trends by someone's twice. latest paper that refers to the last two years. That is just bad stats. Kerry's arguments are by no means the consensus at this point. Virtually everyone at the National Hurricane Center in the U.S. disagrees with it. So stop mixing consensus, the latest paper, and the trends over a hundred years. Trends over a hundred years are not changed in two years. Well, I want I to make you very quickly a question, and we'll have one minute to answer. And actually, I would like to start with you based on what you just mentioned to him. You just said that trends of two years are actually not significant. For long, well, no, I'm saying if you have a trend determined oh, over a hundred years, Two years fluctuation cannot change it. Exactly, I agree. But before that, you also mentioned that the last 10 years, which 18. is also, wait a second, you mentioned before that in the last 10 years, and that was your argument, the climate change actually haven't increased. So you may also, just let me finish and let me elaborate my question. On the one hand, you say two years is not significant in a trend of 100, not even 10. And in the last argument, you mentioned 10, the last 10 years, actually, climate change haven't increased in terms of heat. So the same argument that you are telling Dr. Mario Molina that he's wrong is exactly the same that you used on your favor two minutes ago. And that will show to you. But well, that's my point. That's a point that I want to make to you. That's a question for you. I agree, uh, Mr. William, that consensus actually is not evidence. And, and I agree with you. I, I absolutely agree. But my question is, I also agree that in science we could be wrong. And that probably we could hear and listen to facts. Consensus is not evidence, but facts and statistics and correlations are. My question has to do with probabilities. In case you are wrong, in case you are actually not with a consensus, but you study strongly the statistics, it's not cost-benefit efficient, as they have said, to avoid the risk of Lawrence mentioned that CO2 will stay here for many, many, many years, and that we could give the chance that we, scientists, you, are wrong and help for the better society. That's my question for you. For you, Lord, what could convince you? What do you need to know? What will be the thing that it will make you change your mind? I mean, it doesn't matter what argument is on this side, as I can hear. If you believe in that they are wrong, I don't understand what could be only a sign that you say, you know, I accept. I was wrong. What it has to happen? We're not going to be able to live 200,000 years to know, or 200 years, or 50 years, or like Dr. Molina mentioned to you, today, what is happening, and which is clear for many people, there is no way that you could watch it. So give me a hint. And that comes me to your question, Lord. You start saying, OK, here were three and here were three. But here we could be billions, and here there will be three. However, well, on those days. three, there is a guy named Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And that's an issue. Uh -huh. And Donald Trump and people like Donald Trump are stopping and are doing a lot of damage to humanity, and mainly this topic, which is urgent, OK? So, Lawrence, mm -hmm. it's important to debate this. And it's important to understand, like Chomsky mentioned, mm -hmm. that there is a great market failure. It's the greatest market failure of humanity, what is happening. This is a collective problem. Mm -hmm. How can we? be able to work, convince, and change the policy of a person like Trump and others. For you, my friend, 
Daniel. I really believe that there is a problem. It doesn't matter what you do, there are still people and there are still countries that they won't do anything at all. It's not the solution, given what you have been studying, that and this panel and this, and this exactly festival of ideas have been about, disruption, that the only way to fix this is not with debates, is with market solutions. How about going to your line? We work and invest in technological arrangements. We human beings are, are not so rational. We're about incentives. What do you think as a solution that the price of oil increases, we invest more in another kind of energy, and we stop debating these silly things in terms of if we agree or if we don't agree, and disruption will be only the solution, and we'll get over because it, we're tired of it. Dr. Mario Molina, as always, thank you very much with Share Ciudad de las Ideas with us. You mentioned at the beginning, 95% of probabilities were right, but 5% were not. And it's a thing that you also mentioned, Daniel. You mentioned many, 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 many years ago, climate change was worse. Oh. But now it's different because we have cities, but when you mentioned many, many, many years ago, and there was not the human factor to make me, to make me doubt, well, without humans, what's worse? Now, you know what I mean? Is there really a correlation? The same thing with you, Dr. Mario Molina. 5% is 5%. And we are in science, and we don't never talk about causation. We always talk about correlations. That's the truth. But when you give 5% a chance, how could you be self-critic to yourself? Give to that 5% the research and the way to show that this 5% could go to 1%. What can we do in science? What can we do to, to because 5% I still think it's a number. What can we do actually to change it? And just to finish, you mentioned at the beginning, it's not expensive to change to other kinds of energy. If that's a fact, what are we waiting for? I think it's still very expensive, or what's going on? If it's not expensive, why, why we are not doing it? I'm sorry if I make you two questions. I, I don't know if he didn't, He'll be is back. he still there or? Uh, he uh, walked out, I, I know, climate change it's disappeared, the people. Of okay. Nature. So, <laughs> señoras y señores, one minute, please, Lord. Well, you asked me a very good question, but it's a good question for the other side. What would cause them to change their mind? And I would like to hear the answer to that. Uh, in my case, I am relatively sanguine because, first of all, warming has benefits as well as disadvantages. And with, the benefit, with modern technology, we ha have a good chance of enjoying the benefits while using the technology to adapt so that we can be less affected by the disadvantages. So the first thing is it would take a very considerable increase in the rate of warming for me to change my mind. In your lifetime. Uh, absolutely, in my, uh, bearing in mind that for a hundred, over the 150 years that we have used fossil fuels, there's been virtually no warming at all. One degree over the whole of 150 Perfect. years. Perfect, thank you, please. Yes, I, uh, I second what uh, Lord Lawson has said. You know, they, we keep talking about probabilities, and someone said once, they're, they're lies, they're damn lies, and they're statistics. And, uh, you know, you can do a lot of lying with statistics. And I can't believe, for example, that my distinguished colleagues really think that there's going to be five degrees of warming between now and 2100. You know, look at the facts. You know, the warming that we've observed the last two decades, it's somewhere, it's, it's around a tenth of a degree 
per decade. You know, we're already, you know, within uh, eight decades of the end of, you know, the century. There's no way you can get five degrees. Eight times 0.1 is 0.8 degrees, right? Okay, so if, how much is that going to accelerate? So, so there, there's lots of numbers thrown away to frighten uh, the uh, okay, gullible. I'm, I'm sorry because of that time, but thank you. Lawrence. Oh, okay, you want me to so, answer your question? Well, this is one case where Trump is irrelevant, happily, um, in a sense that leaders on important issues generally lead from behind. And the really important global changes require the people. And there's a history for that. There is success for that. We, we often feel impotent. But in fact, movements can do things. And that's why the leaders, that's why what's happened, what Donald Trump has said is irrelevant. It's even happened at Bonn that other people like Governor Jerry Brown and other people have said, look, we're, our local communities are doing something. The Pentagon, who cares about these things, is writing reports on the security implications of, of climate change because they need to know the realities. Much of the business community, which relies on the realities, is doing something. With Vietnam, with Noam Chomsky's here, with the Non-Proliferation Treaty, with, with CFCs, we have changed because we've gotten the public involved, and that's the only way things are going to change. Leaders lead from behind. The public has to convince them to act. We agree. Okay. You don't want to... Please. No, I... You can get all sorts of enthusiasm for issues. I'm a little bit disturbed at the difference in facts that are being discussed and the way they're being thrown around. I objected to your statement that I was using 10 years for a trend. I was simply pointing out the obvious thing, that predictions of the models for warming have greatly exceeded what is observed. And I think as far as Nigel might have said, you know, if you want to know what would change our opinion, sure, if you kept on seeing that the observations exceeded or went with the models, you'd have plenty of reason to be concerned, but they're doing the opposite. And so the question should sometimes be addressed by an objective moderator. What would it take to change the mind of the other side? Good point. Absolutely true. But I, I actually forget a little bit what you asked me, but let me, let me just sum up in this way. Um, the Earth warmed by one degree and we think one to five degrees. You know, William, the reason we're worried about five degrees, I think it's on the outer realm. That's why it's the upper edge of the probability. It's the, it's the outer edge of the air envelope. And I think there's lots of things in the climate system that are possible feedbacks, positive feedbacks that could accelerate the problem. I hope they don't happen. And by the way, I hope that Richard is right, that Dick is, that Dick is correct, that it's only gonna be another half a degree or three quarters of a degree. That would be wonderful because I do fear that many people will suffer. I care about the people in the developing world and they do have a right to get out of poverty, but we have to help them with a new pathway with new technology that can actually make their lives better and not have risks of suffering from extreme heat or sea level rise or a variety of other factors. Thank you. Terminamos con el Dr. Mario Molina, por favor. Okay. Let me first, to be fair, address what would it take to change my mind? Well, very briefly, if I were to see a very reasonable scientific set of logics uh, statement that goes with the fact, science is based on evidence. If that comes through, I would certainly change my mind. But I think the facts and the evidence are just the other way around. That's why I disagree very much with, with my uh, friend Dick Clinton, that the facts actually point the opposite. Temperature is changing more, but if you look at the overall budget, again, some recent papers have documented that very clearly, the, all this energy that appeared to be missing, oh, it's in the oceans, as, as was pointed out before. It's there, so all the logic says, shows that we are on the right side. But to finish, we've done it before. We did it with the ozone layer. People were against it, but the probability was large. And all the planets got together and we solved the problem. It can be done. Let's work together. Bravo. Bravo, bravo. Un aplauso para todos, por favor.
Gran, gran día. Wow. Luces, por favor, luces. Quisiera preguntarles a todos ustedes, además de agradecerles, a alguien de ustedes que al principio pensaban de esta manera o pensaban de esta manera, ¿han cambiado de opinión? Perdón, no me digan no, ¿alguien sí? Ahora, por ejemplo, Jacobo, ¿qué opinas si antes qué opinabas? Ah, no, tú, perdón, es que no veo bien de lejos. No, ¿cómo voy a leer tu nombre? Discúlpame. José Manuel. ¿Pensabas como este o como este? Tienes dudas. Pero entiendo diferentes razones. Ok, ¿quién más que haya cambiado de opinión? Para, para atrás, por favor. Sí, te escuchamos. A ver, era más fácil si le pasaban el, el micrófono por ahí, pero bien, gracias. Si sí, a mí me pasó lo mismo, yo estaba como muy clara con la postura de, del, del cambio climático y me parece que los argumentos de este lado fueron más sustentados, más firmes eh, y dieron como más data precisa. Acá se generalizó mucho y me hizo dudar y cuestionarme cosas que no me cuestionaba anteriormente. Entonces, felicito al equipo de este lado. ¿Alguien más? ¿Alguien que haya cambiado al revés? Señoras y señores, el tema es que este es un programa... Perdón, perdón, Chi, por favor. Don Sergio, a ver, alguien tiene un... Perdón. Or... Yo quiero decirles que empecé con esta posición y que después de escuchar estos argumentos me quedo enormemente más preocupado del cambio climático porque han sido evidencias científicas contra cuestiones ideológicas. Muy bien, ok, muy bien. Pa, por favor, le pasan el micrófono a Sergio. Gracias a, por una excelente discusión, Andrés. Mi, mi observación es la siguiente, y de alguna forma no cambié completamente de opinión, pero lo que estamos viendo es un diagnóstico adecuado. Creo que sí está cambiando la temperatura, creo que la actividad humana tiene una, una, eh, una participación significativa, no sabemos cuánto. El diagnóstico es correcto y lo ha señalado perfectamente el doctor Mario Molina. La pregunta es si la medicina que se ha planteado es la correcta y nadie se dedicó a ese tema. Tenemos unos acuerdos de París que no resuelven el problema en caso de que, hayan, de que el diagnóstico sea correcto. Y eso es lo que no vimos en esta discusión. Totalmente. Sí, por esto lo de los precios, la energía, las nuevas tecnologías. Señoras y señores, eh, José Luis Mateos, ¿quieres decir algo? Que eres físico, ¿no? Esteban Moctezuma, que ha estado en este tema involucrado, ¿dónde se encuentra? Ah, se fue con los niños ya. Señoras y señores, alguien más, el último comentario. Paz, te escucho con vos. Lo que están diciendo está muy bien. Lo creemos porque ellos son los científicos. Señoras y señores, yo termino con esa conclusión. Nos queda a nosotros investigar y estar conscientes de que si le estamos haciendo un daño al mundo, este es un serio daño y ya hay que hacer algo. Y nosotros somos responsables de ello. Nosotros somos responsables de ello. Muchas gracias. 30 minutos de break. Quédense en las suelas ideas. <risa>